muted. Greetings, everyone. Apologies, we had a little audio uh, hiccup there, uh, but we're happy to get started. Uh, we're glad to have you with us on the line uh, and hope you're, you're comfy and looking forward to the next hour and a half. My name is Glenna Harris from Prosper Canada. We would like to begin by acknowledging that we are joining you from Toronto, which is situated upon traditional territories. The territories include the Wendat Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nations, and the Métis Nation. Toronto is in the Dish With One Spoon territory. The Dish With One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabek, Mississaugas, and the Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans, and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. Today, the meeting place of Toronto is still the home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community on this territory. We'd like to acknowledge and thank everyone on the line joining us from traditional territories across Turtle Island. We are honored to be having this discussion with you, and we thank you for taking the time out of your day to join us. Before we get started, uh, here are some quick logistical announcements. Uh, as audience members, uh, you have been put on mute for this webinar, but we do hope that you'll engage with us uh, with the question box at the right of your screen on the control panel. Um, also on the control panel there, you'll find a few handouts that you can download and refer to during the presentation. There are four altogether, because um, we'll be referring to some great worksheets uh, from the Managing Your Money resource, and we've included a few of them uh, at your fingertips there, in case you don't have access to them already. Finally, uh, as you're a registered webinar participant with us today, you're going to receive an email uh, a few day, within the next few days uh, with the webinar slides and a video recording uh, from today so that you can catch up on anything you might have missed or share with someone else. And finally, uh, if you are on social media, uh, we'd like to invite you to tweet with us today. Uh, we use the hashtag ProsperWebinar uh, for all of our webinars, uh, and uh, we ourselves are on Twitter at ProsperCan. Prosper Canada works with partners in all sectors to ensure that Canadians, regardless of income, have access to financial programs, products, services and advice that they need to build their financial well-being. Prosper Canada's programming in financial literacy and financial coaching is part of the work of the Prosper Canada Centre for Financial Literacy, which is co-founded and supported by TD Bank Group. So we have an exciting panel for you today. Uh, up first, uh, who you're going to hear from in a couple minutes, uh, we have Simon Brakupe, who is Anishinaabek Haudenosaunee uh, Bear Clan, Kitigan Zibi uh, Anishinaabek First Nation, Maniwaki, Quebec. Uh, Simon is the Vice President of Education and Training for AFOE Canada. And among his many, many contributions and qualifications, he is also the author of the Literature Review of Indigenous Financial Literacy in Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and the United States, which he published for AFOE Canada. He's also the author of the Aboriginal Retirement Planning Handbook and Course for AFOE Canada. And uh, last but not least, he's also an accomplished artist, and he's the creator of the beautiful images you're going to be seeing today uh, in the presentation, as well as uh, in the Managing Your Money resource itself. Uh, next, uh, Natasha McKenna. She is the uh, with Prosper Canada here, and she is the lead of the First Nations Financial Wellness Project. Uh, she has served as a financial literacy trainer as well. She has more than 10 years experience in financial literacy and in working with Indigenous communities. Uh, she has a master's in education and community development from OISE at the University of Toronto. She's from uh, Prince Edward Island originally and of Scottish, Irish and mixed European heritage. Uh, and finally, I am Glenna Harris, uh, Manager of Learning and Training here at Prosper Canada. Uh, I have uh, education from the University of Toronto uh, here, right here in Ontario and a background in both academic teaching and not-for-profit training and communications. And I'm 
happy working here at Prosper Canada now and all kinds of exciting financial education work. Uh, so we are your panel for today and we're looking forward to getting started. So again, uh, we're so happy to have you. We've got more than 90 of you on the line with us today, which is amazing. Uh, we hope that you're comfy and have perhaps a cold beverage on this warm day. We, uh, we've planned this event to tell you all about the Managing Your Money resource in case it's new to you. And even if it's not, we'd like to share more with you about ways you can use it with individuals in your community uh, as you encourage them on their way towards financial wellness. First, we're going to tell you a bit more about the resource and why we developed it. And then uh, next, Simon is going to tell us quite a bit more about uh, the significance of land-based teachings and financial wellness in Indigenous communities. And this is going to help us also learn more about the animals that you see featured uh, in the booklet and in the worksheets. Uh, then we'll share more with you about some of the activities that are created in the booklet, and this is where you can access those handouts in the control panel if you like, if you don't have a copy of the booklet with you. Um, we're going to look particularly at some of the ones around goal setting, budgeting, and needs and wants. These are all really important activities if you're getting started thinking about money, so we'd like to share more with you about those. Um, and as well as some extra tips around how you can center your money conversations around uh, the individuals you're working with and their personal motivations. Um, and then finally, Natasha is going to tell us more about uh, how we can work with these as part of, of both one-on-one -on -one conversations as well as financial education workshops with groups. Uh, and then we're going to have a few minutes for Q&A at the end. So again, please send us your questions as you think of them. And at the very least, we'll take a few minutes at the end to, to answer as many of those as we can. So that's going to be uh, our session for today. So uh, many of you may already know about managing your money. Maybe some of you are using it in your communities as well, which is which is fantastic. Uh, but if you're if you're not, if this is brand new to you, we'd like to introduce it to you uh, and tell you a little bit more about why we made it and what it's all about. So managing your money is a, is a resource that we developed uh, as a part of helping uh, as financial education support for helping individuals meet their money goals. And, and this can be used both as uh, a full booklet, uh, as you can see in the pictures there, we do have it available as a, as a spiral bound booklet with all seven worksheets contained at once. Um, but also the individual worksheets themselves are, are focused on one topic at a time, uh, that you can do this one part at a time and focus on, on one part of the money management process uh, as, as you need to. And if you're looking for the resource, if this is brand new to you, uh, you can find it either for free as the PDFs uh, at the link there on our learning hub. You can download them for free at any time. Um, and if you'd like to, to purchase the books, we have them available at cost. They are approximately $135 for a box of 50, uh, plus the cost of shipping. And we, we have those available from Prosper Canada directly. And this is just a view of all seven workshops, uh, worksheets, pardon me, and the, the topics they, they use. Um, we did design it in a sequence as a full set of seven, uh, but that doesn't mean that you have to work in that sequence. Uh, you can start with the topic that is most relevant to the people you're working with, uh, or just take the conversations according to the motivations of the people that, that you're working with. Um, the idea is that if you were to complete one worksheet from beginning to end, you would have completed one step in that process of figuring out what, what you need to do to set a goal, to figure out what money is coming in, what money is going out, how you can track that with a budget and other things you can work towards like savings or preparing for tax time or figuring out when your bills are coming in and how you can manage them. Um, we certainly designed this resource with an Indigenous audience in mind, which you're going to hear more about today. Um, but we also recognize that it may have relevance among non-Indigenous audiences and offer an important learning support for them as well. So please be guided by the needs of the individuals you, you support and please feel free to ask us for more information as you need. This is just one example uh, of one of the worksheets, uh, what it looks like from start to finish. This one is all about tracking your income, which is, you know, a good first step. If you're going to eventually be looking at a budget, you need to know how much money you have coming in each month and also where it's coming from. 
So here the, the worksheet starts out there on the cover with a little bit of explanation on why income tracking is important and where you might look to find that income coming from. And then on the inside, it gives you quite a bit of space to write these things down uh, over a couple of months, as well as reflect more intentionally on whether this is something that changes from month to month, if you can predict your, your income will be the same each time, or if there's going to be any differences that you can think of. And then on this one, on the, on the back fold there, there's another activity just to think about other sources of income or other resources. You may, for example, have uh, be working with someone who has seasonal employment where they don't have that money coming in each month, but it's something that is still really important in their money management. Um, or you may have um, other resources that aren't in the form of money, but that may still be a very important part of how they budget what money they have to spend. So these are... These are a couple of activities that we've bundled together in this worksheet to help you work with someone in that income and, and resource conversation. So that's how each worksheet is designed as sort of this start to finish completed activity. And, and if you did them in a sequence, you would be well on your way to helping complete a money goal. Uh, but if you did them one step at a time at your own pace, that's, that's also very, very uh, good to do. We'd be remiss if we didn't acknowledge all the many people and sources of support that went into creating this as well. We had a really great time creating it, but none of us do this uh, alone. Uh, and we, we really wanna acknowledge everyone who, who supported this resource. The content that we use uh, was adapted both from our own financial literacy curriculum here at Prosper Canada, um, as well as some from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau uh, in the United States. They have a Behind on Bills booklet, which uses a lot of great uh, similar material that we were very inspired by. And we're very grateful to have partnership with AFOE Canada on this resource, as well as support from the Ontario Trillium Foundation. So, that's been quite a few minutes of myself talking and we'd like to find out more from you in the field uh, and ask you a couple of quick poll questions. So if this is new and interesting, new and different for you, uh, this is going to be uh, a poll that you can see on your screen and you can click with your mouse. Uh, first up, uh, tell us, are you already using the resource in your community? Is this something that you've already started to use in either form, either in booklets or in the PDF download. So I'll give you another uh, 45 seconds or so to answer. Uh, maybe a quick second to find your mouse if you've been listening in and, and need to go back to your screen. So maybe you have yes, maybe you haven't yet, or maybe you definitely want to, you just haven't gotten to it yet. All right, I'll close the poll in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So on that one, it looks like more than a third of you uh, aren't using it, uh, and almost half of you aren't using it yet, but you would like to, and we've got about 15% of you who are already using it. So it looks like we've got uh, several new folks on the line who are uh, looking to use the resource but haven't yet, so that's great. Um, and, and we hope that you'll be inspired to, uh, to look at it next after, uh, after today. <laughs> Um, and then secondly, we'd, we'd love for you to tell us a little bit more about yourself and the, the kind of financial empowerment work you do in your community. Um, and this is one where you can check any uh, that apply to what you do. Uh, so you don't have to be limited to one. So for example, do you do financial education work, workshops? Do you work one-on-one, -on -one, perhaps as a financial uh, coach or a case manager? Are you supporting tax clinics in your community? Are you, um, are you developing resources yourself? Uh, you're someone who uh, produces resources for your organization or your agency. And uh, perhaps you do some of these things, but as a manager or supervisor capacity. So I'll leave this open for another 30 seconds.
So I'm going to close this in 10. Five, four, three, two, and one. So this is fantastic. So uh, what we can see from this is that all of you are doing uh, quite a lot of work in your in your communities uh, across the financial empowerment uh, programs. Uh, so a lot of you are doing financial uh, financial topics uh, workshops. That seems to be really the the majority there so that makes sense that you'd be interested in this presentation so we're glad to know that we're reaching you today um, but we're also really happy to see that diversity so that we can tell um, so that we can tell who we're who we're with today uh, and we've got almost a almost a hundred of you on the line today so actually that breaks down pretty pretty neat so we've got about 60 of you who are working on a workshop so that's that's wonderful. Thank you for thank you for sharing that information with us. Uh, we're happy to know more about about who's on the line today. Uh, we also want to acknowledge that uh, we are having some sound issues uh, on our webinar, and it, and we know that it is breaking up a little bit occasionally. We we are working on it, uh, so we're we're gonna forge onwards uh, with our session. Uh, we we hope that we won't have uh, cause to. Uh, pause too dramatically today, but we want, want to let you know that we are aware that the sound issue is happening uh, and we're, we're managing as best we can on this end. If you uh, should happen to miss something, uh, if the sound drops out for a significant period of time, uh, please keep in mind we will be sending all resources to you at the end of the session, uh, so we, we will do our best to make sure you, you receive everything, uh, all of the content we're working with today. So for our next uh, portion of the presentation, I'm going to turn things over to Simon, who's speaking with us from the field. Uh, Simon, can you uh, speak all right on the line? Are you getting through to us? <laughs> yeah, I can hear you perfectly. Perfect. All right. Well, Simon. So quick we'll... way, everybody. <laughs> thank you, Simon. We'll yeah. turn things over to you. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, so my name is Simon Brockape, uh, I'm Algonquin and uh, Hunasani, and uh, I'm from Gitigan Zibi, uh, First Nation, which is uh, just a little bit north of Ottawa. But uh, as you all know, uh, Ottawa is in the in Algonquin territory. So it's a pleasure uh, to be speaking to all of you this afternoon. So I'll talk a little bit about AFOA Canada. Uh, we we're we're involved in capacity. As a basis of all this work is uh, financial literacy uh, with a focus on, on wellness. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. So we're going to talk about financial wellness uh, and teachings from the animal world. Uh, I, when, we, when we first started talking about this, uh, we, we talked about uh, reaching out to the Indigenous community, but uh, we designed it so that it resonates not only our life goal or one's life goals. And we look at it holistically uh, from a physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual aspect. And this is uh, uh, critically important to uh, Indigenous people, but, uh, but also to, uh, to Canadians. And we're looking at over the life cycle from uh, uh, child, youth, adult, and senior. And we're looking at uh, maintaining a state of wellness for not only ourselves as individuals, but our families and our community. So the next slide, uh, when uh, uh, Prosper and AFWA uh, first talk, started talking about this, we 
discussed uh, developing a framework uh, that will help guide us in the work we, we do. So you can see in the middle, we got this, the theme of individual, family, and community. And on the top, uh, which faces east, uh, as human beings, we, we like watching the sun come up. So we're facing the east. Uh, we're talking about financial capability. And we achieve that through uh, education and counseling. Uh, so many of you uh, work in a counseling area, so I, I think you'd find this uh, uh, significant. Uh, the next step uh, is developing higher incomes and the uh, uh, manage your money uh, tool. Uh, the, the seventh tool talks about uh, uh, filing income tax. And as many of you know, you can double your income if you're low income. Uh, through uh, filing income tax and accessing uh, some of the benefits federally, provincially uh, uh, to your income. Uh, the, the third uh, uh, step is financial inclusion, and that's affordable financial products and services. And a lot of the uh, indigenous communities we live in, uh, we don't have uh, easy access to uh, these services. Uh, so, but I think that's important, uh, important aspect of uh, addressing those issues at the community level. And then uh, financial security, uh, the fourth step, uh, and that's uh, having savings and asset building. Uh, and that can be achieved through uh, uh, income tax filing and uh, in other means I will be talking about uh, this afternoon. So the next slide, uh, we talk about uh, land-based teachings. Uh, it's a it's a favorite theme of mine. Uh, uh, indigenous people, those of you that remember the uh, uh, Royal Commission on Aboriginal People, say the first thing that the Royal Commission talked about was the uh, the uh, relationship that Indigenous people have uh, with the land, and uh, the land is our our teacher. Uh, it teaches us about uh, savings, uh, sustainability, and security. Uh, and uh, at creation, animals, birds, and fish were asked uh, what they could uh, teach humans. I, and I think a lot of indigenous cultures have similar uh, stories. And uh, particularly in the Algonquin community, uh, uh, the animal world uh, uh, offered their uh, characters and their behaviors as a way to teach humans uh, about values and, and, uh, and about the land in particular. The next uh, slide, uh, we have a loon. And uh, I, I, I thought this was an important uh, uh, image to, uh, to start with because uh, we find the loon on our loony. I, I think it's the only uh, currency in the world that has a, a loon that uh, uh, all Canadians understand. But the loon teaches us to pay attention to our, our dreams and our hopes. Uh, the, loon, uh, the loon is a unique uh, Canadian symbol with its beautiful voice and markings. Uh, if, you, if you watch them in the fall, you'll actually see them uh, uh, going to, uh, into flocks and they, as, they, as they fly south. So it's an important uh, symbol for all of us uh, to keep in mind, uh, particularly around the idea of uh, establishing money goals. I, I think it's a good import, it's an important uh, place to start uh, with Indigenous people. Uh, uh, when we think about uh, the thought process, uh, we have uh, uh, some people think holistically, and I think a lot of Indigenous people do that. So you've got this idea of uh, 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 looking at the holistic aspect and then going to the, uh, uh, to the point uh, down the road, the goal down the road. And a lot of uh, Indigenous people, uh, uh, their thought processes and the learning processes uh, is, uh, is orientated this way. The next slide. Okay, I'm unmuted. Okay, 
So uh, uh, tracking your regular income. Uh, 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 Chickadee is interesting because, uh, first of all, I think uh, the uh, the bird of Ottawa is the chickadee, uh, and it saves uh, sixty thousand seeds uh, for the long winter. Uh, it's uh, it brain actually increases thirty percent in the fall. Uh, I, I I always tell people I, I can't even find my uh, car keys and a and a chickadee goes wrong. Uh, finding 60,000 seeds uh, for the long winter. The chickadee uh, is an important bird uh, across Canada. You know, in some cultures, the uh, chickadee is uh, seen as for its beautiful songs. Uh, I know up north, uh, the, uh, the Cree, uh, when they see chickadees, they recognize it as being a very uh, uh, tough bird in the winter. It, uh, uh, it, it's the only bird out on a really cold day. So the chickadee has uh, great importance to uh, to all of us, uh, uh, particularly here in the summer. I can hear the chickadee uh, call in the summer, and I, I just love the love its uh, its song. So the next slide, uh, uh, we have the moose. Uh, I. Uh, myself being an artist years ago, I, I did a, I was trying to draw a moose. I did a moose painting, and there was a exhibit in uh, Quebec City, and I was telling one of the elders, this moose took me uh, two years to uh, to paint because they're so ugly. And uh, the the elder said, "What? Ugly?" He got really mad at me. He says, "They're beautiful. They're perfectly adapted to the environment. They can swim. Uh, they have their hooves are hollow." Uh, in the in the forest, it can even though with its big big antlers, it can uh, go smoothly through the uh, so the, through the forest. So I, I think the the moose uh, is important to uh, all of us. We all have moose stories. I, I have several moose stories from my uncles, uh, but it teaches uh, about uh, adapting uh, to be adaptive uh, uh, with our money and with our our, uh, our resources. The next slide, uh, we have the turtle. Uh, so it, we we always hear the story about the turtle uh, uh, is a symbol for Mother Earth. That uh, in a lot of indigenous cultures, uh, we we see Mother Earth uh, and humans on the back of a turtle. Uh, the turtle teaches that the land provides us with an endless supply of everything we need. And I think that's uh, core to uh, indigenous sustainable thinking that uh, uh, we don't live in a in a world of uh, 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 resource uh, uh, shortness, but we live in a world uh, with uh, resource endless resources, provided that we uh, uh, we obey the. Uh, uh, laws of the land and we uh, manage our uh, resources responsibly uh, and our money carefully. So uh, what I like to think is that, uh, you know, when, when I'm purchasing something that uh, these, the uh, particularly uh, products, that those products come from the uh, natural world and that uh, those resources come from the natural world, that uh, we should be conscious of how we spend our money so that uh, uh, the natural world and the resources around us uh, are being uh, harvested uh, sustainably and responsibly. Uh, next uh, slide. So uh, the beaver, uh, you know, we see the beaver on our, on our uh, currency, and it's also a symbol of hard work. Uh, uh, for Algonquin people, uh, some of our stories about the lakes, uh, are, are symbolic that uh, the beaver created the Great Lakes. In one of our creation stories, the, the beaver uh, creates the uh, Great Lakes, including the, the lake that uh, uh, what is called the Champlain Sea, uh, where Canada is now, or where Ottawa is now situated. Uh, the beaver uh, also teaches that it's possible to uh, shape our lives by our hard work and planning. Uh, uh, Canada is a land of lakes, and it's the beaver that created those lakes uh, in uh, 
historically over thousands of years. Uh, if it wasn't for the beaver, we, we would not have as many lakes uh, as we do. So the beaver is important to uh, our ideas of, of uh, budgeting uh, because the, the beaver is very careful with the resources that uh, it uses to uh, create a livelihood for itself. Uh, next slide. So the bear, uh, I, I'm from the bear clan, and uh, in some cultures, the, the, uh, the bear is, uh, uh, the bear clan people are medicine people. We see the, uh, the bear as the head of, uh, of the animal world. Uh, the bear can teach us the importance of keeping healthy and well. Uh, there's a, an old uh, uh, pictograph in, on one of the lakes uh, in our region, and it's a, it's a bear, and you see the bear's tracks, and it's a story about uh, even though the, the bear is large, it walks softly uh, in the, uh, on the land uh, and doesn't destroy the land. So it, it, uh, it's an important teaching uh, for all of us. Uh, the, uh, the other thing the bear uh, does is it uh, it brings uh, the animal world together together from time to time uh, in uh, in the council to uh, resolve uh, some life issues uh, particularly for the animal world. Uh, uh, one story is the uh, uh, the animals were feeling uh, uh, uneasy and the, and the bear uh, uh, called the council together and. It was uh, before we had partners, before there were male and female, and uh, the animals uh, talked about uh, their unease, and, and the bear said, well, what we need is we need partners, we need male-female partners in order to uh, live in balance uh, uh, in the world that we live in. Uh, it's also important to uh, setting uh, savings goals uh, uh, for our families and our communities. Uh, We'll go to the next slide. So the 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 otter is the uh, symbol of unity. And uh, at the beginning of time, the uh, animal world was asked uh, what they could teach uh, humans, and the otter said that uh, it could teach uh, humans about unity, finding balance uh, through its character and behavior. I think a lot of us, when we see uh, the otter, uh, we, uh, we we draw from our uh, our our own references uh, about about the the otter. A lot of people find the bot, the otter very uh, friendly, uh, playful, and uh, the otter can help us achieve our uh, balance in our work life through work, uh, family, community. Uh, the uh, the otter is a, a guide to resolving life's ups and downs, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, the, the otter uh, uh, is also the symbol for, for we're using for preparing our tax filing to find that balance uh, by being able to uh, file our taxes, particularly uh, low income, it enables uh, the family to double, uh, double its income. It's a, so it's really important part of uh, the financial thinking that we're we're trying to get across to uh, in indigenous communities. Next slide. So I'll turn Simon, it over that, to Glenn. That's, yeah, yeah, Simon. That's been a wonderful uh, tour of the animal stories. I I, uh, I was reflecting myself on on a few on a few things as you were speaking. Um, and, and for those of you listening in right now, we'd like to, to pause for a moment and ask you, you know, maybe especially now that you've had a chance to listen to more uh, from Simon, then um, is, there, is there any one of these animals that speaks to you in particular? Um, or do you think there's some way that, you know, is there a new way that you might be inspired to have money conversations uh, about, the, about these, these kind of topics in thinking through um, this kind of wisdom. So please, uh, if you have any thoughts, please type something into the, the, the question panel on the right. Um, 
Simon, as you were as you were speaking there, I was reflecting especially on the chickadee uh, one and and how you say it has such a really great memory for how well it it stashes aside its its seeds. Uh, during the winter, um, I was just on a short trip this weekend, and I forgot so many things. <laughs> I forgot <laughs> to bring my my phone charger with me. I forgot to bring uh, one of the books I was going to read uh, on the weekend. Uh, so clearly, I think I need to spend some time <laughs> with the wisdom of the chickadee. Um, we've got a couple of responses coming in. Um, uh, Lisa, thank you for your comment. Uh, she says they really speak to her because uh, uh, she didn't realize uh, so much about the chickadee in particular as well. She, she says she thinks it is a really sweet animal, but she appreciates knowing more uh, about it. Um, uh, Stefan, he said he always likes to have metaphors to help make that start into, into money conversations. So he said he really he appreciates that metaphor that he can start with. Um, and finally, uh, we've got a comment here from, uh, oh, another Lisa, because, uh, Lisa Patterson, <laughs> saying that she really likes the holistic approach uh, that the animals bring. I think you really emphasize that quite well, Simon. Um, and then uh, one more, uh, Liana says uh, that they, she likes the way the animals offer kind of a hopeful look at money management, that there's a quite a positive, uh, hopeful spin. Um, and, and a couple more comments, again, on, on the chickadee and the, and the loon. Uh, I, guess, I guess the birds especially are speaking to us today <laughs> out there in the audience. Um, so thank you, everyone. Thank you for those comments. Um, uh, we're going to collect all those ones that we didn't get a chance to, to report back out loud. We had a few more come in there. So we're so happy to know that they are speaking to you and that they're helping get some some, some thoughts going about how you can integrate these into, into your conversations. Uh, so Simon, I'm going to turn things back over to you uh, for our next topic on, on goal setting. So, so back over to you. Thank you. Okay. So uh, we, the uh, one animal that, that we were talking about uh, uh, was the otter. And you can see on this uh, uh, graphic on the bottom is, you know, it's two lines and uh, uh, it, the uh, otter tail design you'll, you'll find in a lot of beadwork in a lot of indigenous uh, imagery across uh, well across North America, and uh, it symbolizes uh, kind of the the road or the path that we're on. It's you know it isn't always uh, a straight line. It's uh, life is up and down, and I think the uh, the gift that uh, this uh, this tool provides us is with the uh, uh, the gift of uh, strength that uh, knowledge enables us to make better decisions uh, better financial decisions for our families and providing us a direction of where we're going a purpose and uh, and uh, the otter offers us uh, its gift of its uh, of its behavior enable us to make those uh, good decisions uh, to have a good life uh, uh, for our families. So we'll get to the next, the next slide. So uh, some facilitator tips uh, for goal setting. Uh, I think earlier I talked about, uh, uh, you know, what we call inductive and deductive uh, learning and that uh, a lot of indigenous people uh, are uh, uh, inductive learners. They look at the thing holistically. Uh, so sometimes starting there uh, is, a, is a good place. I've been an educator for a number of years, and, and I found with uh, the indigenous students, a lot of times uh, some of the concepts uh, that you know we're, we're, we're trying to learn uh, are difficult because we might start from a uh, a specific, which is a deductive approach, uh, rather than looking at the uh, the large, the bigger picture first. So some of the tips is uh, it brings uh, uh, goal setting brings clarity to what a person wants. Uh, it brings purpose uh, to our monetary and non-monetary goals. 
Uh, it breaks down the goals into doable and measurable actions. Uh, and to achieve our goals, uh, we can identify new habits. Uh, we've talked a little bit about uh, nudging, nudging habits, uh, uh, moving uh, uh, to new things, uh, or new behavioral change, uh, uh, little by little. I, I, when I was uh, 40, I decided to uh, cut out uh, uh, soft drinks, get, get rid of that, uh, that sugar intake. But I decided not to uh, do it overnight. I, I just gradually stopped drinking pop over uh, a number of years, and uh, that, so those uh, uh, those approaches create new habits. And we often tell people if, if you know they're budgeting goals, if they they're not uh, achieving their goals, uh, and they, they fall behind a little bit, that uh, they they got they have to keep working at it, uh, not to give up. And uh, uh, by looking at our past accomplishments, we can see that some goals were easy to achieve, uh, while others require a little bit more planning and effort. Next slide. Uh, so mind maps are uh, uh, quite interesting. They were developed in uh, Scandinavia. Uh, but if you look at a lot of indigenous art, uh, beadwork, you, could, you can find mind maps in there. Uh, so th this is a basic mind map. So in the middle, you would put, uh, well, we'll just say savings. And then we could uh, ask uh, if you're working with a group or individual uh, to uh, uh, think about how they, how they could save uh, money. The next slide shows you a, a little bit of uh, work that might. So uh, uh, savings, uh, buy in bulk, use coupons. I've got a cousin that uh, is a, a coupon uh, king. Uh, she has a coupon for everything, so I, if I'm saying, oh, I want to buy this, she goes, oh, wait a minute, I, I've got a coupon for that. So coupons can actually save uh, a lot of money, and uh, uh, at the end of the year, uh, you know, I mean, you may be saving uh, $0.10, cents, $0.25, cents, $2, or $50, but at the end of the year, uh, it's a, a very good way to uh, save money. Uh, so the, the other one's uh, buy things on sale. Uh, my wife... Uh, buys pretty well everything on sale uh, and we buy out, out of season uh, so uh, at the end of winter we're buying uh, clothes she, she actually buys clothes for uh, the friendship center in the, in the spring and we donate the uh, 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 snowsuits and stuff to for kids in the fall uh, check uh, flyers uh, for compare comparison prices by no name products so uh, th this is a, a excellent tool to uh, uh, get people to uh, open up and, and think very broadly, holistically about uh, uh, about a subject. Next slide. So uh, uh, we'll go through the uh, uh, savings goal settings. Uh, we've got the the uh, table on the right. Uh, so. Uh, get people to write down as much uh, money uh, you need to uh, to reach your goal. So it might be specific. Uh, say, uh, uh, I want to save enough money to pay off my uh, uh, credit card, or I want to uh, go on a trip. Uh, a lot of times when we're uh, out in communities, uh, families will save money for uh, uh, a vacation trip or uh, go to a hockey game. So uh, you just set the amount that you need, uh, the time frame that you need uh, to do it in, and uh, how much uh, you need to save on a monthly basis. So I think uh, you know we're all familiar with the the SMART uh, goal setting. So it, it's got it should be specific, uh, measurable, attainable, uh, and uh, there's a time uh, a time frame for it. Next slide. So over to uh, Clement. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Simon. Um, thank you for breaking that down for us as well. And, and I like the way you uh, were talking about your own savings and, and sort of budgeting practices that you bring in. Those are, those are uh, really good points of connection to, to give. Um, and we can all sort of look for those. Um, we wanted to check in with, uh, with you listeners uh, again as we 
uh, as we think about the, the goal setting and the savings uh, portion of of this of this type of work, uh, because it is such a useful step to think about what are you working towards, because uh, that can help you, you know, find motivation and all kinds of other things that Simon and Natasha will get into a bit more later. But we're interested, interested to hear from you in your work. What types of money goals uh, do individuals in your community often choose to work on, based on your experience in the field and based on your work with the people you support? What kinds of goals are really common for you to uh, to, to help uh, people work through? I'll leave this open for another 20 seconds or so. Um, you can check more than one in this case if 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 you know that you know more than one of these is something that really comes up a lot in conversations. I'll give you another 10 seconds. And five, four, three, two, and one. So we'll see our results here. It looks like um, paying off debt and, and making a budget are coming in very, very strongly as, as really important money goals. So um, that's, that's, really, that's really useful information for us to hear about too because those are, those are both very, very foundational steps and, and really two that I think go very well together uh, since you know, if you know how much uh, you know, how much money you're working with and how much spending you're working with in, in your budget, that can really help you put your, your debt payment into context as well. Um, but it looks like savings for a goal, almost two thirds of you are looking at that one, and then filing taxes and children's education coming in quite close there at the end. And of course, these aren't the only kinds of money goals that uh, people, may be working, people may be working on in your community. These are sort of uh, five of the most common ones uh, that we hear about, but you may have other folks working on, for example, some kind of large purchase or uh, perhaps even a simple step like checking in on their credit score. Uh, some of these can be very, very significant goals depending on the person uh, and their uh, their life context. So, so thank you uh, for that poll. And uh, I'm going to go back to Simon for another couple of slides on, on the budgeting. So now that we, especially now that we know that budgeting is a really common goal for you, we're excited to talk a little bit more about it. So Simon, back over to you. Boy, you really planned this well. Yes. So uh, needs and wants. Uh, you, you know, I think uh, if, if we walk away with anything, uh, it's that needs and wants uh, discussion. Uh, my, my mother's uh, 91 going on 92. And uh, she's on a limited budget. And uh, whenever she talks about uh, uh, purchasing something, she, she she goes into this this discussion about needs and wants. Uh, so I, th you know, I think it's an important discussion to to have, uh, particularly if you have a limited uh, budget. But I, you know, I think for her, it's finding finding that balance, uh, and sometimes finding that balance is a is a discussion. But not only is she openly discussing it, but also I think uh, educating us. Maybe she's telling me that uh, I'm, I, I'm buying stuff that uh, is more of a want and uh, less of a need. So, uh, so the next slide. So uh, Maslow, I, th I think probably a lot of you are familiar with uh, the Maslow hierarchy of uh, needs. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about this because uh, it relates to our thinking about uh, uh, making uh, uh, purchase decisions also. Uh, so uh, Maslow uh, uh, learned all this from uh, uh, Blackfoot Indians in, in Alberta. I, a lot of people don't aren't aware of this, but uh, Maslow spent uh, a, a lot of time out there uh, uh, learning about uh, how do we achieve a good life? Uh, he calls it uh, self-actualization. Uh, so a lot, a lot of uh, indigenous communities call, how do we achieve a good life? Uh, uh, Iroquois talk about uh, the good mind, uh, the self-actualization. And it all begins uh, uh, with the, the uh, 
this slide calls physiological needs or what is our basic needs. So sometimes uh, uh, you'll see on, a, on a, these Maslow pyramids. Uh, but uh, when we look at uh, what are our basic needs, uh, we can look at it from a spiritual perspective. We need air. We can, we can only live a few minutes uh, without, without having air. Uh, we can only live a few days without having water. Uh, we can live uh, for a few weeks uh, without food. So these are the basic, uh, the basic needs that all humans uh, need. And from an, an indigenous perspective, uh, these uh, things, air, water, uh, the land, are, are considered sacred. So I think we can understand that uh, from an indigenous perspective and from a Canadian perspective, that um, the, the basic needs of our life uh, are important to us as humans and is uh, sacred important to us. Uh, at the next level, uh, we see safety needs, uh, uh, things like heat, uh, particularly in Canada, we need heat. Well, not this time of the year, we need uh, cool air, uh, air conditioning, but we need uh, uh, homes, uh, so that those satisfy our our basic needs. I, th I think a lot of uh, when you're looking at people with low income, it, you know, it's the cost of uh, housing that's uh, critically important. Uh, and uh, so that's our, our safety needs. Social belonging, uh, we need uh, uh, our, our family, we need social supports. Uh, we like to call that uh, medicine, uh, our family could be medicine, our social supports could be medicine, and it's important to uh, uh, our social belonging. Uh, in a lot of indigenous cultures, we talk about uh, all our relations, uh, and we look at the uh, not only uh, the human world, but the animal world, the fish world, the bird world, uh, as being related to all these things, and that uh, our relationship with all these things are important. Uh, there's a lot of work being done uh, these days about uh, happiness, uh, that we need uh, that social interaction uh, with friends, family, even daily. Uh, if you get on the bus, uh, talk to the bus driver, all these things are, are critical uh, uh, to our happiness. Uh, and then uh, the fourth area is esteem. All these things, the, uh, our, our basic needs, our needs for safety, housing, our social needs, are all make an important, uh, play an important part for our own uh, self-esteem, that who we are as human beings. And I, you know, I think uh, uh, the important work of uh, financial literacy uh, is that, uh, as you all know, that uh, 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 finance or not having money uh, is uh, uh, critically uh, important to our, to our own mental health. Uh, uh, being poor is, uh, uh, has an impact on our own mental health. That's why these, all these other things become critically important to uh, finding that balance uh, in our life. And then again, the self-actualization, uh, uh, living a good life, uh, living uh, and having uh, 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 a, a good mind is uh, also important. So we'll go to the next slide. So uh, needs and wants, we talked a little bit about uh, that already. Uh, my mother's, uh, uh, discussion on needs and wants. So a need is something uh, you, you cannot live without. Uh, we talked about the uh, Maslow uh, needs hierarchy. We need food, we need a place to live, transportation. Uh, these are base, our basic needs uh, uh, as human beings. Uh, we all have wants. We want something uh, you would like to have, uh, but could actually live without. Uh, in, in a lot of our workshops, we've we find uh, these important discussions uh, uh, within a family that uh, uh, young people want uh, the expensive runner, uh, 
when a uh, a no name runner would uh, suffice. Uh, and so there's that discussion: is that really a need or a want? And I think uh, the earlier earlier we have it, uh, I think some of the messages uh, will get onto our to our young people. Uh, we we have the uh, 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 dollars and cents. Uh, uh, kit that we'll be talking about later, but in the dollars and cents, uh, at, in grade three, we're talking about needs and wants. Uh, so sometimes we uh, uh, can feel uh, like needs, uh, which makes it hard to, to let go of them, that uh, I really need that, uh, that fancy pair of runners, uh, but it's expensive. We have to figure out uh, which expenses are needs and wants, and it's uh, important to have uh, these discussions uh, in our families and in, our, in the counseling sessions uh, that you have. Needs and wants. Uh, next slide. So, uh, uh, so when you're working with people, you can write down a list of your needs and wants. Uh, you could use the, uh, uh, the mind map. Uh, uh, you could have the people share it with a uh, partner. This is perfect for uh, uh, splitting people up into twos, and they can talk about uh, uh, what we call a, a you know trade-off, uh, uh, reducing the amount you spend monthly on these needs and wants, uh, or trying to find a balance uh, uh, for these different uh, products. A trade-off is another way of satisfying a need or a, and a want. For example, instead of purchasing takeout food. Uh, you can save money by making food at home, which is probably a lot healthier for us also. Next slide. Budgeting. What's a budget? Uh, so a, a budget is, is finding that balance between uh, income and spending over time. Uh, a tool to tell you what your money is doing. Uh, a plan can help you manage your money and plan for your future. And uh, it's a snapshot. Uh, it's it's a roadmap. But uh, in the uh, in the booklet, we we talk about uh, uh, finding those paths. Uh, the uh, uh, the the otter helps us find those paths, those ups and downs. So uh, budgeting uh, it can use all those. I think as somebody uh, mentioned earlier, as a, as a metaphor, uh, and it's an another way of uh, uh, thinking about it, I think a lot of people, like particularly me, I, uh, I, I don't like the idea of budgeting, somebody uh, controlling how I'm going to spend my money. But it, but if I want to look at it from a, uh, uh, a parent's perspective, how am I going to save money for my children's education or uh, we're planning a trip, how are we going to save money for that? Uh, so we need budgets. Next slide. So... Uh, before creating a budget, uh, we, we know what we, we need to know what we want to achieve. Do we want to pay off debt? We talked about that in that survey. That was excellent. Uh, creating an emergency fund, uh, uh, living within our means, uh, saving for education, a visit to family members, uh, saving for winter clothing, a car. So those these are all uh, goals that. Uh, uh, we could be discussing with with our clients. So uh, next slide. Uh, so coaching tips. Uh, I, I think these are important. Uh, you, uh, keep in mind that uh, everybody has a unique situation. Uh, uh, everybody's unique. Uh, every person is different. They have different incomes, employment, family type, culture, values, and challenges. Uh, so we have to be open to that. Uh, budgets are human-centered tools. The same approach or tool may not work for everybody. Uh, find their motivation. <coughs> What's the, their goal or motivation? Uh, and uh, work on that. Be non-judgmental. Uh, I think that's an important skill my mother has. Uh, when people are asking her advice, she's doing a lot of listening and, and uh asking them how they would solve that, their problem. So it's getting them to solve their own problems. Uh, be non-directive. Remember that a person is creative 
capable and, and uh, resourceful. So either working in uh, one on one or in groups. Uh, a lot of times, working in groups, they can they can find solutions to other members of the group's uh, problems. Next slide. So uh, finding money. Uh, I, I, I like this part uh, because a lot of people are very uh, creative in terms of uh, finding money. Uh, uh, take another look at your needs and wants list. Review your budget. Uh, list some of the things that you buy often. Uh, write down how much they usually cost, the average price, how often you buy them, and uh, figure out how much you usually spend on each thing each uh, uh, time of the month. And then work with a partner uh, if, if there are ways you could reduce spending uh, to saving towards your goals. And in a lot of the workshops, we have uh, people talking about how they uh, uh, they save money to uh, to get those uh, needs or wants. Uh, and it, uh, they have a lot of creative solutions, uh, uh, working part time, uh, doing beadwork. Uh, and there's many other ways doing fundraising. Okay, so we'll go to the next slide. So uh, for, uh, Natasha will take over from here. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, Simon. That was great. So thank you, Simon, for of the stories and some of the activities and uh, approaches and principles for the Managing Your Money resource. And thank you to Glenna earlier for the uh, introduction. I am a program officer at Prosper Canada and I want to say hi to everyone on the line today. It's awesome and exciting to have so many of you uh, join us to learn more about the resource. Um, there are a number of high quality financial education tools and programs and we see that many of you on the line are uh, facilitators and uh, do work one-on-one -on -one or develop curriculum. Um, but uh, starting off with some of the work, we realized that there was, uh, in our work with AFOA Canada on the financial wellness project, that there weren't a lot of accessible financial information and tools for um, Indigenous learners. And uh, I want to uh, uh, note uh, the comment that was made around it, uh, the positive intent behind the images and the stories. So what we want to share here is the, some of the thinking and suggestions for um, how to use the Managing Your Money booklet either uh, in a one-on-one -on -one, um, or in a group workshop settings. Um, and there was a, a question as well on the line that we want to answer. So um, we have three uh, ways that we had kept in mind that um, people may be using this resource is based on how financial uh, literacy or financial empowerment programs are delivered and that's as a uh, in its most effective way as a guided one-on-one uh, -on -one tool for money management conversations to support individuals and in, uh, identifying and setting financial goals as you uh, can probably tell this one's mostly oriented around that uh, core financial topic of uh, budgeting um, but also could be used as a tool to um, complement or as a basis of a financial literacy or a budgeting workshop and um, we also know that for uh, there's just a lot uh, people in the field wanting uh, resources that they can hand out to um, participants or community members at the end of a tax clinic. Um, so there's three different ways that the resource can be used, and it really depends on how you deliver services and also the capacity that you have. Um, so there's a question that we received. Um, we've been handing the booklets out to our workshop participants. Is there reasons clients shouldn't go through it on their own? Um, so it's not that we don't think the booklet could be a helpful resource for someone. Um, and we'll provide some tips to think through. But um, if you're using it as a handout, um, think about um, based on your participants, uh, is there any information that you could provide um, when handing it out that might support them in completing the resource? So I think we've all been at different uh, info fairs or picked up information and uh, open the booklet at the end and uh, go through some of those tasks. So um, it's really going to depend on your uh, the participants in terms of how much support might help them uh, for using the booklet. For others, they're going to be geared up about budgeting and ready to go and so excited to have an additional resource. So we just want to provide some specific guidance and tips for using the booklet. Um, and I want to acknowledge that many of you as brings that 
uh, experience in your work. So some of this may be new content and some of it may be familiar. And if you have specific tips that you find, um, we also encourage you to share them in the comment box. Um, and if we have time, we'll be able to share some of those as well. Uh, so on the next slide, um, many of you on the line mentioned that you do one-on-one -on -one work um, or considering providing one-on-one -on -one support. So we wanted to share a model for uh, working one-on-one -on -one that we developed with AFOA Canada based on a traditional healing path and a model for financial coaching conversations. And this was developed together as part of our work in the First Nations Financial Wellness Project. Uh, so it may be a helpful for thinking through how you might use the booklet in a one-on-one -on -one basis with individuals and families uh, towards that goal as Simon articulated for um, living a good life. Um, so when we think about this, it's based a lot on coaching principles. And I think a lot about when we may have um, had the services of a coach in our life or benefited. For, so for many of us, that's been perhaps in sports in the past. Um, so just like in sports, having a coach can uh, help us identify and reach a personal goal. Um, we don't often have those supports, particularly in um, Indigenous communities as well, someone who would be able to support a conversation uh, specifically around uh, money goals or money challenges. So this one-on-one -on -one approach can uh, give a basis for partnering with individuals holistically uh, with their strengths and goals and recognizing challenges and systemic barriers they may face. So at the core, it's anchored in uh, we're supporting uh, behavior change. So as Simon spoke about, that nudging. Uh, it's recognizing the uniqueness of individuals, and it's providing uh, guidance and support and ongoing encouragement. There are four steps to the uh, model. And so I'm really going to touch on them uh, a little bit briefly. Uh, so the first step at the top is building the relationship to create safety and trust. And I've learned a lot from uh, Simon in this area, but one of the things that he shared is, you know, creating trust is a critical first step in developing relationships. And it's particularly important in working with Indigenous peoples because of history of colonization. So trust can be difficult to achieve, but also easily lost. But we can all look at experiences of when we've built strong relationships. So um, thinking about uh, sitting down with an individual in the booklet for a money conversation uh, in advance thinking about how you've developed uh, trusting relationships in the past and one key area for uh, one on work as well as in workshops is to attend to confidentiality so to ensure the person you are working with knows from the outset that any of the information shared in your conversation or in their worksheets is confidential and if it's a new relationship it's a good time to ask them some questions more about themselves and uh, those uh, social relationships that Simon spoke about. So who are some of the supports that they have? So the second step on our money conversation is listening and learning. Um, and so Simon shared the importance of identifying uh, broader goals. And the first worksheet in the money booklet is designed to help with that goal setting process. So um, before we start the task of making a budget, we want to step back and look at the, the why. So uh, what's important to them? What are they hoping to achieve. So as a coach or a supporter, you can help the participant identify goals for them that they have for themselves, their families, and their communities. So our goal here and role is to help and listen and ask questions. And so we'll share a few uh, question ideas that you could use in a money conversation. But that key really here is listening for beliefs and values uh, and strengths and resources. Uh, that the participant has that can help them on their, their journey of this path. Uh, so the third step, uh, and this is what we call taking the financial wellness journey. This can sometimes be a long journey, <laughs> um, and sometimes it can be more difficult. Um, sometimes it can be easier, but this is where we can support action through um, nudging habits. So uh, once a goal is identified, that's creating a monthly budget to eliminate credit debt or saving for a hockey tournament. Uh, as a coach, you can help to break down some of the action items into more manageable steps. Um, so the handouts that you have in there are meant to help support that breaking down into steps. Um, and part of that is, uh, so the key in this step is uh, keeping that uh, positivity built on the participant's strengths. And another 
area that can be particularly supportful is thinking about uh, how to remove some of the hassle factors. So you may have heard from the participant in your listening state or have faced in the past. So what are some ways that we can uh, help to remove some of those hassle factors? So the final step uh, is completing and celebrating. So this step uh, could be the end of the journey or the completion of a stage or a goal, say um, setting up a monthly budget or um, uh, staying on track of a monthly budget for uh, three months. And so it's a time to celebrate. And so you can do that by uh, taking a look back together and hearing from the participant um, some challenges that they've overcome, new skills that they've developed, and new concepts learned. So uh, that's sort of with the assumption that maybe you've met with them a couple of times on their, their budget. Um, but you could also take a chance at the end of one session to uh, look back and celebrate what has been accomplished that day. So, there are lots of ways that that can be done, but a simple uh, congratulations or a handshake or a high five are really effective. And then the cycle can continue from there. Um, one of the examples we heard from our partner at uh, Waklinikong on ceded territories, uh, they've used this model in their income tax clinic one-on-one. -on -one. So using that opportunity to uh, celebrate the completion of uh, filing taxes or um, applying for a benefit uh, can note something that was stressful or challenging for the participant uh, that they've now achieved and is kind of that relief us their tax their tax list. So that's a kind of a frame that we think of that goes along with the, the booklet for having one-on-one -on -one conversations. On this slide we're looking at what we call powerful questions. The questions are really helpful for working one-on-one -on -one, and when we think about those uh, the answers that we get to questions really depend on how they're asked. So uh, powerful questions you may be familiar with are open-ended questions that help animals, sorry, not animals, <laughs> I apparently have the otter on my brain, uh, help individuals tap into their own guidance uh, and answers, perhaps with support from the animals. Um, so for a question to be truly powerful, um, we ask it from a place where we don't presume to know the answer. Um, so a couple of things for thinking about what makes a powerful question. We've uh, gave a few examples here that you might find helpful for um, understanding more about motivation or getting permission before uh, working on a budget or go towards goal setting. We want questions that are uh, short and simple, open-ended, have a curious side to them, and also a, a positive intent. And on the next slide, we have a few uh, examples of, uh, for on the one-on-one -on -one journey, you may find that the person you're working with is already doing a really great job of managing their resources. And so this is one way that um, we can acknowledge, uh, particularly for individuals who have been, who are living on a fixed income. Uh, I think that's often where we find some of the strongest budgeters, people that um, you know are living within their means and, and stretching a dollar. So it's a great opportunity to acknowledge uh, success and resourcefulness that they have. So these are a few um, things to keep in mind when in a coaching conversation is an opportunity or one-on-one -on -one to uh, acknowledge the work that someone is doing, uh, to celebrate an accomplishment or um, steps that they've been taking, opportunity to brainstorm. So Simon shared that mind mapping the tool with us to complement the uh, questions in the Managing Your Money booklet. Um, but also how we can support uh, by holding individuals uh, accountable. So if you've made a commitment to work with someone on their uh, monthly budget, how can you help set them up for, for success for um, future meetings? And finally, for tips, we wanted to share a few for um, facilitating uh, money workshops. So we know we have a number of you on the line who um, deliver financial literacy workshops or budgeting workshops. And a lot of the principles with uh, facilitation are very similar to those one-on-one uh, -on -one in terms of creating a, a safe learning environment, uh, in particular in this context, a culturally safe learning environment. So these are a few uh, tips that we wanted to highlight. So um, I think on the poll, we saw that many of you are new to the resource. So um, 
when facilitating any workshop, first we want to take that chance to kind of review the guide or curriculum that we have and think about uh, how might you need to uh, adapt that for the learners or participants in, uh, in your group. Um, for starting out for workshops, uh, it's important to have a, an opening and also a clear purpose. Um, and beyond the opening for the, uh, the content and the uh, activities that you'll do together, uh, depending on your community, that may include having a traditional opening um, or arranging an elders to um, open or support the workshop. The other tip that we have is for using stories and examples that are relevant to your learners. So um, we've provided some stories to the animals. You may have other animal stories that are more relevant to your community. It's also an opportunity to share a relevant personal examples. So a lot of facilitators um, sharing your own experience of um, having done a budget and some of the challenges, but also some of the benefits that have come from that. This one is a standard adult education one, but we all walk into the room with uh, existing experience and knowledge, so uh, drawing on the experience in the room. So, for example, activity four is on uh, tracking bills. Uh, so we can start things like asking why it's important to track bills or seeing what are some of the things that people already do for tracking bills before uh, telling them how. Paying attention to group dynamics, uh, so using icebreakers or energizers. Usually when we do our financial literacy train the trainer session, someone says, is this going to be fun? <laughs> because I think their assumptions is that it's not going to be fun because it's about money. Um, so you may already have a bunch of energizers in your toolbox. Um, one that we often use in the financial literacy curriculum is an activity called um, Just Imagine. So it's imagining uh, a windfall that someone might win, like Lotto 649 or whatever the lotto might be in your province. And uh, that exercise is particularly helpful. It's both fun, uh, but it gets people thinking about um, what's important to them and their money goals and their goals in general. Um, another uh, tip that we wanted to share, and that's through you've taken a chance to walk through the booklet, is any of the activities that you want your participants to do, it's important to um, either demo it, um, but at the minimum providing uh, clear instructions so they know what uh, and how they want to do that. And finally, the last couple that we have is um, if you're looking to have people do a budgeting, you may want to provide a uh, scenario budget. So we often use a persona like Mike and we have participants develop a budget for him. So that can be a safe way for people to try out um, budgeting in a group setting that doesn't involve sharing their own uh, personal uh, finances. Um, and finally, uh, offering a range of activities. So the booklet was designed for uh, kind of one-on-one -on -one personal work, but you can also break that up into a variety of solo and pair and group exercise. And actually, this is finally <laughs> always ending with a strong close and an opportunity for goal setting. Um, so that could be asking people uh, to share one thing that they learned in the workshop, but also what's one thing that they plan to do. And so for that uh, kind of behavioral uh, supported Change is we want to give people a chance to reflect and think about how might they apply what they've learned uh, in your workshop uh, to their own uh, financial management. Um, and we can often skip the goal setting piece, um, but that's, gonna, that's kind of key for where that learning transfer is and supporting people to the application. Um, so uh, that's the, the highlights of tips that we wanted to share with you today. And I'm going to hand it back to Glenna for Right. Awesome. Thank, thank you so much, Natasha. Um, and as well, Simon, um, this has been, this, this session so far has gone by very quickly. We, we've been uh, learning so much from, uh, from both of you and for, for a lot of different ways that we can work with the resource and the topics that are involved there. Um, and we wanted to make sure we, we kept aside some time for questions. And we have had a few questions come in already. If there's something else that you've thought about, if you're listening on the line, um, please feel free to type it in. Uh, into the question box, and we're going to do a few right now. Um, so Simon, I wonder if this would be a good question for you. We have someone asking um, about the animals. Um, are the animals and their analogies appropriate for for all First Nations? Uh, 
it, it could be. What, what I would say is, uh, uh, you know, I think Natasha said that also, that uh, uh, these are uh, sort of generalized uh, stories. Some of them come actually from, a, you know, my Algonquin uh, background. Uh, but I think I would encourage people to uh, uh, draw on their own stories, uh, local stories. Mm. Uh, so, I, you know, you could say, uh, you know, that this is a story in the, uh, it, you know, in the, uh, in the tool, in the guide, but do you have other stories that uh, resonate uh, for you? We've tried to use animal images that uh, are animals that, that were uh, across Canada so that, uh, mm -hmm. So everybody knows about beavers. Uh, everybody knows. Got it. Audit. Yeah. So what would um, would you have advice, Simon, for if someone's using this in a community where maybe a different animal story would have more resonance than the one that, that is associated here? So what I would do is, uh, you know, talk to, you know, if you're going into a community and you're going to use the tool, I, I would talk to the organizers about uh, do you, you know do you have bear stories or do you have moose stories that are right. that are, are relevant uh, to, to your particular community uh, that's and, great thank uh, you yeah 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 no sorry carry on Sam. I, I didn't mean to interrupt you <laughs> no no I, I well I, I would just ask locally you know yeah and you, you need to plan in advance also right so, Right, know your audience, know know where you're walking into, and yeah, yeah that's that's great. Um, that's 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 good advice. We uh, we had a question come in uh, from someone who works with seniors and caregivers, and as asking about the literacy level of the booklet, um, I can answer that one pretty quickly. Um, I actually. I haven't got the confirmed sort of number of literacy level with me right now, and I don't want to I don't want to wrongly say which literacy level number it's at, but I can tell you that the resource has had a plain language edit uh, involved uh, in its development. So we created the content and then made sure there was a clear language editor reviewing it to make sure that it was um, broadly accessible for different levels of literacy. So that's a really great question, and uh, we're going to try to find out the answer for you and see if we can get back to you with a, with a more specific level. I know that's important to many programs if they're working with people with lower literacy levels, so that's a really good question. Um, and this might be for either Natasha or Simon. Uh, we had a question come in. Um, asking about the high five is high five uh, is that something that's appropriate or or used uh, for people for indigenous people? Uh, Natasha, I don't know if you wanted to answer that one. I answered generally, and then Simon, you can um, share. I think uh, coming back to the idea that each person is unique um, as to whether or not how you would celebrate that. So um, if you're dealing with youth. Um, I think a high five is an appropriate, um, perhaps the seniors, you never know, they might like a high five. <laughs> um, but I definitely think that it's uh, both, I would use your judgment as a facilitator, as a one-on-one -on -one support. Uh, what's the most appropriate way to, um, with the individual and the relationship you have to acknowledge support? Um, some people may have closer ties of relationships and, um, and not, so I wouldn't say that you would do anything that would be uncomfortable for yourself or the participant. Mm -hmm. um, but in mm -hmm. terms of being culturally inappropriate, I don't, I don't, um, hard, hard one to, hard one to say <laughs> definitively. Well, <laughs> yeah. Simon, what well, would be your I'll, response? <laughs> yeah, uh, I, yeah, it's an important question. I, you know, I think uh, our Powers of observation are important. You know, if you're working in a uh, community you're not familiar with, I, you know, you could uh, uh, just say, you know, how, you know, how would you congratulate each other, or just have at the end have people congratulate and just observe what they're doing. You know, I, I you know, I think it's critical. Uh, I, I went to uh, India to Goa once, and uh, uh, 
you know, I was not familiar with the culture, and I, and I was observing that the older men were holding the hands of younger men, and I, and I was, of course, younger then. And, uh, and in, in my community, we don't hold hands, so I, I was ready right. for somebody to hold my hand. <laughs> and, oh. and not, <laughs> So yeah. observation is critical, I think. Yeah. That's cool. yeah. That's great. That's that's a, that's a really good rule to start with. Yeah. Um, I think we have time for one more question. And Simon, uh, well, or maybe a second one. We'll see how long it takes to answer this one, and then we'll see if we can do another one. Uh, we've still got a few minutes. Uh, Simon, I want to ask you this one. Uh, we've have, we have a question about what if the facilitator for the workshop is not a person of indigenous background? Um, would the audience feel you know, would the audience feel uncomfortable? Would that feel like they're they're trying to take over their culture? What would be what would be a way to address that situation? I I uh, I don't think I don't see it as an issue. I think uh, I think Natasha really covered the that medicine wheel teaching of uh, of you know talking and listening and learning. I, you know, I think you you've mm -hmm. got to build trust. Uh, and even if you're an indigenous person, you still have to build that trust. And so I think being yourself is important, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 so I think uh, uh, being honest, being being yourself is critical to uh, building trust with uh, indigenous people. And, uh, uh, you know, they, they're there to get information and uh, your expertise. So, uh, you know, I think and, and relaxing and laughing. Laughing is a uh, mm -hmm. is the secret weapon, I think. You know, I think that should <laughs> that out. <laughs> yeah. Well, I I mean, those of us here uh, on this end of the webinar today, we've definitely been been having our share of laughter listening to you and uh, listening to your stories today, Simon. So I think that's that's a really great note to end on. Um, I know we have a couple more questions that we didn't get to, and I, I definitely apologize to our listeners that we, we run out of time. Um, but we we want to really make sure to let you know that this is not the end of the conversation with this resource. In many ways, it's just the beginning. Uh, please look for more resources to accompany the, the booklet uh, in the next few weeks. We are almost concluded developing a facilitator deck to go with the resource. So you've been hearing about all these great facilitator tips and workshop tips. Well, we're going to have a presentation deck that you can use uh, on your own uh, with the resource uh, to deliver your workshops. And the, the ink is almost dry, or rather it's digital. So the digital ink is almost dry. The pixels are almost put together. So you'll hear more about that uh, if you're subscribed to our newsletter. But you can also find it online at our Learning Hub uh, which is one of the links here. Uh, you'll receive these slides with all the links that you can click, and I believe you can also click them on your screen now. Uh, but if you want to find out more about the resource, if you need to order copies from us, if you want to download the PDF for free, there's a link there for our, our Learning Hub. And uh, among other things, there's also um, a survey, the very last link there, we're asking for your feedback if you've been using this resource already. We do take your feedback very seriously. We always want to know how we can make sure our resources are being used well and how we can make them better. So we really would love to hear from you. And if you take the survey, if you'd like to include your name and contact information, we're going to put you into a draw for a free box of 50 booklets. So there's uh, there's there's potential bonus for you in, uh, in, in giving us your feedback. Uh, most importantly, uh, we want to thank you for being on the line today. Uh, thank you, Simon and Natasha, for giving us uh, your expertise and wisdom. Uh, we know all of you that your time is valuable, and we're very glad to have spent it with you today. Uh, so please be in touch uh, if we can help you with more information about this resource or this webinar. And we hope that you'll subscribe to our newsletter to find out more about future learning events uh, later this year. This will certainly be a continued conversation. Have a wonderful afternoon, and we look forward to seeing you again next time. Bye-bye. Thank you.